So we get to the hotel in, in Chicago and weirdly enough, because yes, I understand you can go to especially airport hotels and buy t-shirts and all of that, but they literally had, let's call them dress shirts. And, <laughs> and, and that's what the, I, I think it was a men's white, just plain dress shirt. But it may have had like kind of puffy <laughs> sleeves. The sleeves are way, way too long. And Sarah couldn't contain herself as I'm wearing these things. And I'm pulling like the <laughs> billows of the sleeves outside of my suit jacket. <laughs> That is TSN Hockey Insider Darren Dreger, our special guest on Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, uh, giving us a little insight on what the trade deadline could look like, and it sounds like it's going to be pretty quiet like it is traditionally at Trade Center. Yeah, the, well. The longest gig in sports by far. I can imagine. That would be tough. I mean, we've done a few little live broadcasts mm -hmm. here, but nothing to obviously that scale and to have to do all that planning and then, you know, the Just juice. sitting there. The juice doesn't really happen for you yeah it's kind of tough Dregs gave a little bit of an insider of like when they're when their phones are like this and they're typing on it you'll 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 have to watch it a little bit later but he talked about okay. what the, what's actually happening when they're going like this planning dinner yeah, or what do we need at the grocery store <laughs> later it, it, it's pretty good stuff so uh, darren will join us a little bit later to talk about how we got into the business the crossover moving from sportsnet to tsn covered a lot of a lot of bases and of course i asked him when did it take uh, what point did kevin shovel day off trust you to tell you more about what, than what he had for breakfast. Okay. Dreger and Chevy have a pretty good relationship going it's, way back. So It appears that way. Yeah, it where does. Did he, did he say where he started? He started in uh, in Brandon. In Brandon? Okay. Yeah, he's, yeah right. Darren's been everywhere. Yeah, he, yeah, I think he grew up in like a town. Like he's from, he's good, he was born in Alberta, but grew up in Saskatchewan. Yeah, he yeah. grew up like, I think it was like an hour up the road from where I worked in Yorkton. Yeah. I remember he was like the legend there. He's a big legend. Yeah. yeah. It's it's been a long path. And of course I asked him how many phones he has. Langenberg, yeah. Saskatchewan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that that sounds correct actually yeah. when I was doing the, the deep dive and Yeah. He's he he's a he's he's he was great. So um we we have to get on track here because Darren was so long, it's cut into our time, which is fine. Ah, that's sure. It's been a long I'll week. I'll allow it. <laughs> oh, there's, there's only two games this week, but <laughs> yeah. so we're, we are exhausted. Uh, the Winnipeg Jets get back on track. Huge win Saturday over the uh, Pittsburgh Penguins. When this pod comes out, the Jets will be facing the San Jose Sharks uh, for one of their two games this week. They will play Saturday in Vancouver. How important was that win for this team, considering that it had been a five-game slide that they couldn't seem like they couldn't score at all? Yeah, I mean, things didn't look great, but I, I think if uh, your paper just went flying. That's fine. There. If, uh, you know, you, you look at that win, and, and you got to be happy about it. Obviously, five-game win streak, you snap that. You, you move on, you move forward, and especially going into a stretch now where you had a few days off in between games. I don't really think going into that way on a six-game losing streak mm -hmm. is best for the mental psyche. So to get that over with was good. The thing about the five-game losing streak for me, though, yes, five games in a row. But, I mean, you have a really good game in Boston. You have a really good game in Toronto that you come out of on the losing end. Eh, the home game against Toronto, whatever. Yeah. And then, you know, one little mistake – and then it's in the back of your net against Pittsburgh, and then the five-minute penalty. Like there were, like out of all those games, the Philadelphia one was probably the toughest one. Just the like, first period. Yeah, we weren't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just the first period. But you're like, yeah, like okay, we didn't probably weren't going to win that game. If yeah, you that many goals in the first period. So fine, whatever. But the other games didn't seem like the sky was falling. Obviously, being able to score goals, you need to do that in the NHL. Uh, but I think you know, getting that win was. Great for the mental psyche. Back on the track at home to mm -hmm. sold out barn. Yep. I think uh, it did a lot for the group. Yeah, and the important part to the, I think the Jets had such a bad. You talked about the Flyers game. They had such a bad start in Philadelphia. I think it was integral. They had a great start against Pittsburgh, yeah. which they did. Nikola Ehlers touches on that. I mean, it was it was huge to come out the way we did. Um, I think we played really well in that first period. Uh, we skated. We worked hard. Uh, I think we shot the puck and, and you know, made it hard for, for them to, to get anything uh, into our zone. All right. You touched about a five-minute penalty that happened in Pittsburgh. That was, of course, Brendan Dillon got a three-game suspension. So Logan Stanley's played two games right now. So I think we have to kind of put this into context, how challenging this has been for Stanley 
to be out of the lineup since December and yep. to come in the middle of the season when everybody's revved up right now. Like everybody's game is different than it was yeah, say, in October sure. and November. So it, kind of speak to the challenge for Logan Stanley here. Well, obviously he's he's a NHL player that hasn't played a ton, mm -hmm. right? And and you can only simulate game situations in practice so much. So he's just not necessarily used to getting guys coming at him at full speed into the corner and then you have to make that split second decision so obviously it's going to take some time to adjust for him and, and he's in sheltered minutes on that last pairing yeah but I, I think you know the two penalties he took in the second period notwithstanding i think you go yeah not bad like for mm -hmm. a, for with all of that context in mind he's played okay so i i don't really think we need to push the panic button or anything with logan in any way shape or form but He's uh, he's looked all right in the time that he's that he's been able to get out there. Yeah, game number three will be against the San Jose Sharks, which will be uh, Wednesday night as you hear this podcast. Uh, to touch on a little bit more on Logan Stanley, here's Rick Bonus and Dylan Demello. Listen, Logan's been good, considering what we've done to him and only playing him as the the number of games we've played. Uh, Logan has done very well. We're very happy with what he's he's done. Yeah, I think he's done a great job. It's probably one of the hardest things to do in sports is sit out that long and uh, you know one physically but two mentally to stay in it and stay focused and I thought he's done a great job he's he's been moving pretty good he's been moving the puck well uh, he's made some strong uh, you know smart simple plays and and that's what we need from him you know we need him to just do his thing and, and be confident with his style and um, you know we don't need him to do anything earth shaking or groundbreaking we just need him to be solid and steady and he's been doing that for us so far. What we did see in the Penguins game was the reuniting of of course, Nikolai Ehlers, Kyle Connor, and Mark Scheifele. Now, they played together a little bit at the end of the Flyers game, but a full game of those three, just how dynamic that line was it, against it was, the Penguins. It was really good. I mean, obviously, they scored that goal, which mm -hmm. was a, a beautiful tic-tac-toe goal. And then also, they had a couple chances prior to that. And then later in the game, there were just sections of that when they were on the ice in the ozone and they were just smothering and yeah. it looked like they were kind of playing with Pittsburgh a little bit. Like, you could, you could see the the straight line speed of Kyle Connor you can see the vision from Mark Shifley and then the creativity from Nikolai all three of those together is makes for something pretty special on the ice so if they can continue to build that momentum as we move forward here into into February I think the Winnipeg Jets will be pleased and, and really bumping Gabe Velarde down with Sean Monahan and Cole Perfetti like that also is an intriguing line now you have two bigger guys on that on that line with uh, a smaller guy in Cole Perfetti who's mm -hmm. got some elite skill. I think if you're the Winnipeg Jets and Winnipeg Jets fans, the way this top six is constructed as it stands right now, you really got to be rooting for it. And I think you have to root for it too, or w fans were rooting for it. Remember when Monaghan, that shorthanded breakaway in the, in the game on Saturday? I thought the roof was going to come off this place. Oh. When he wound up for the fake slap shot and it goes off the post. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, you and I were sitting beside each other, and I said, did he? Could he? Was he going to slap yeah, shot that? I know. Which uh, would have been legend. Yeah. Just – Clapper on the PK breakaway. He would have shot to the top of the legendary charts here in Winnipeg had that short. Yeah, that would have been pretty in. legit. But uh, let's hear from Nikolai Ehlers and his thoughts on being reunited with Mark Shifley and Kyle Connor. I mean, all three can skate, and, and when we use that, we make it hard for the, for the defense to, to step up on us. Um, and that creates time and space for us to, to make the plays that we know we can make. Um, in the second period, I think at least for myself, tried to make a, a bit too many plays and turn into some, some turnovers. So overall, I think we played really well. But again, there's there's things we can clean up as a line. Um, so yeah, it was exciting. Hi, I'm Mark Shifley. And this is the Ground Control Podcast. Now time we turn into the mailbag, and the question of the week was, what would you like to see the Winnipeg Jets add at before the trade deadline? Of course, with Darren Dreger being the guest, I thought this would fit. So we go to the mailbag. Dieter says, a big right-handed stay-at-home defenseman, hopefully to play with Morrissey. I still like Dylan DeMello there, but that's neither here nor there. Reed says, second pair right-handed defenseman. And finally, Corey says, top four right-handed defenseman or a higher-scoring middle six right winger. So here's what I take from this. Okay. If you're a hockey parent, and your kid's a righty. <laughs> yeah. You better put put, put them on, on the D. blue line. Put them on D. Put her on D. Doesn't matter because they will go places in this game if you are a right shot defenseman. They are very, very valuable, as we will see at the trade deadline. Chris Tano's name out there right now as a member with Calgary Flames. But we'll, Darren Drager will address that a little bit later here in the show. In the meantime, you didn't get to go to Philadelphia because you were doing other things. 
Talking with you? Yes, you were. And uh, there was a monumental save made by a certain individual. Pretty big. Named Lauren Brassois. We will go to that right now. Here's our play of the week. Five on three, Philadelphia. Zamula faked it. Paling, centering pass. What a stop by Brassois. He got the paddle on it as Cates is denied. Net off the moorings in process and then the back door shot. And does Brassois get a piece of this? Get another look from the back door. There was the shot. You bet he does. Paddle to the post. Keeps the puck out. Big save from Lauren Brassois. He will not be on the move. The Jets will not be looking to acquire a goaltender, I believe, with the trade deadline. I could have asked Dreger that, but I just feel comfortable at this time. At this current juncture. Uh, at this moment. That is not a need. Not a need at all. What the needs are could change. They'll probably acquire a goalie. <laughs> As we say this, and then people can yell it at me. Yep. I said it. You didn't say it. So, um, Darren Dreger, of course, from TSN, a hockey insider. Long time. He's been doing it forever. Um, you've been watching him since birth, I imagine. So he's, yeah, uh, he's been around. <laughs> I've seen the the color of the hair change. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, man. He's wearing glasses just, now. He wore glasses. Just gotta the, point the, that out. We yeah. all get old. <laughs> sure did. <laughs> sorry, Here's I called mother. you old. I called you old. I'm you, sorry. It's just, sorry. It's just what the young kids do nowadays. <laughs> Dregs, <laughs> let's take it away. <laughs> Pleased to welcome to the program. He is the TSN NHL insider, Darren Dreger. Dreger, um, I'm going to get right to it. What's the biggest difference between covering the league now than it was when you covered the Jets in the 1.0 edition? <laughs> uh, <laughs> social media, even yeah. the internet to some degree. I mean, <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of tongue in cheek, but I can remember my days, early days, that then it was CKY television, and uh, we were right across from Winnipeg Arena which might have been the most convenient thing ever, right? Like, even if I wasn't working the games, had to do late night sports, I could still go to a couple of periods and then race out the back door and, and uh, get back into the hockey office and, and away we'd go. But yeah, I mean, I, I could answer that just about anything in general when yeah. it comes to covering hockey, covering sports the way that we do. The last 15, 20 years of social media has changed everything. Um, when did you know being an insider was for you? Uh, probably in 2006 when Bob McKenzie, the pioneer of the insider business, um, he was at TSN, I was at Sportsnet and I was kind of dabbling at that point. I was, I was still a host, um, with the, the number of panel shows that we had and whatnot. Um, but largely because of some of the uh, relationships and whatnot that I, I made covering hockey, um, in Winnipeg certainly in Brandon, you know, in my Western Hockey League days, these were now players and coaches and executives that were finding their way into the circles of the de uh, decision makers in the NHL. So I started to utilize that more so on background as I was covering a game or, you know, preparing for the number of panel hits that we used to have to do. But then all of a sudden, I, I, you know, I started accumulating information and now I'm I'm starting to break the odd trade or the odd coach hiring or some of these things. And what yeah. was weird about it, Jamie, was it was actually more of the U.S. side of things that started paying attention to it than it was, you know, some of my Canadian counterparts. I used to do something with Pittsburgh on a weekly basis, just talking about, you know, some of the 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 kind of rumor speculative speculative type of stories around the National Hockey League. But I'll, I'll, I'll kind of wind this up in saying that the reason I brought up Bob was Bob came to me during the Stanley Cup final in 2006. And he goes, hey, um, you know, at that point, Bob probably had three other jobs on top of being an insider at TSN. And he said, you know what? I'm tired of knocking heads with you. Um, I know that TSN is looking for another insider. Would you be interested? And I said, yeah, I, I'd be interested. He said, okay, well, let's let's get through the playoffs here, through the Stanley Cup final. We'll have a follow-up conversation. We'll go from there. Stanley Cup gets awarded. Uh, I meet Bob Poolside at the McKenzie Manor back in uh, 2006 <laughs> um, and, and just decided that this was likely the decision I was going to make and this was the path that I should jump on. Um, and I'll I'll never forget Scotty Morrison, who was uh, essentially the head of hockey at the uh, sports at the time, just said, you know what, uh, I need you to hang in here with me. You know, we've got some challenges we're about to face. Scott and I are still dear friends. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't bring myself to bail on him. 
So I declined the first gesture made by TSN. And then all hell broke loose at Sportsnet that summer and people were fired and Morrison included. Uh, and Mark Millier at the time with the TSN circled back and he goes, I never do this. You know, you say no once, then you say no forever. But Bob has asked me to come back to you again. Are you, you know, are you, are you willing to reconsider? I said, yes. And I signed on with TSN the next day. Did Scott Morrison being like leaving or being fired kind of change your decision at all? hundred percent. Yeah. One of the best guys. Ah, one of the best guys. And and look, we were surrounded by really good, hardworking people there. I got to tell you, people, you know, it's, people have asked about this experience in the past, but you know, I kind of nibble around the edges. One of the, one of the hardest conversations I've ever had in my life was with my good friend, Nick Kiprios, who's still a good friend, but it broke his heart when I said, look, man, I'm going to the other side. Um, here's why. And he was devastated because he just felt like there was an opportunity uh, for me to explore maybe something better, something bigger at Sportsman at the time. And given the fact that, again, Scott Morrison, who I still call my mentor, had been dispatched and they were changing the direction management wise. I just knew that it was my time and, and I made that decision. So without doubt, if Scott Morrison had remained on, I wouldn't have made the move. Yeah, it's kind of wild how the business works. And you kind of answered part of my question in this one, Drex, is I, I wanted to ask you in a, in a funny kind of way, what are your relationship like with the other insiders? And you already answered about Kipper. What's your what's your relationship like with Elliot Friedman? You know, it's solid, right? Um, yeah. Elliot, you know, look, I, I mean, it's, it's not collusion. We don't work together. Um, you know, we're, we're cordial, we're friends, I would say that, you know, in season, you know, he wants to break every story and he's gotten real good at doing that over the years. So I have nothing but the utmost respect for, for Elliot and for all of them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but in season, you know, that's why we do what we do. What, what's become obvious though, Jamie, is the fact that the only people that seem to care about the moment of breaking the story are the actual insiders, right? Yes. Because yeah. it's like you wear that badge of honor for 30 seconds and then somebody else has it and then somebody else has it. And, you know, there's more details that surface and the rest of the hockey media just goes about their analysis of what just transpired here. And and even the brass of, of all those involved, I, of course, they'd prefer that their people break the stories or are first, but you got to be right. I mean, that's predominantly what, you know, our mantra has always been. So I would say that the relationships are, are excellent. When we meet at the general managers meetings or the board of governors meetings, man, we do a lot of laughing. We stand in those <laughs> hallways of these fancy yes. hotels. You've been there. I mean, what yes. else are you going to do? I mean, yeah. you, you've got to tell stories and you've got to have some fun. But as soon as the doors kick open and the managers come out, we're all like ants, right? We scatter. Yes. We go to our, our collective contacts and our sources or who we think you know, is going to be the story of the day and, and, and away we go. So, yeah, I, I would say that we're certainly friendly in most cases we're friends, but in the spirit of the season, man, we want to beat each other. No doubt about that. What's it like when someone steals a story that you have been sitting on? Yeah. Well, hold on. Steals or breaks a story. Bre that I've let's been go with breaks. On. Yeah. Let me, let's turn that. Let's turn that differently. Bre <laughs> yes, breaks yes. a story that you've been sitting on. <laughs> yeah. It stings. Right. But yeah. I've gotten better at that, Jamie, to be fair. Um, just because, you know, and I think that the most people that, that I would call contact, I've got longstanding relationships and I think that they would appreciate this. Uh, for me, it's always been about the long game. It's always about the long game. And yeah, I, I put heat on some people when I know something is about to go down or they've shared in confidence with me that something is about to go down, but you can't report it, right? And I've been burned lots of times. Every insider is not, and burn maybe isn't even the right way to describe it. Like, you know, if you have a player who's a big piece part of a trade that hasn't yet been told or somebody in the deal hasn't been told by the new general manager or more importantly, by the old general managers who are moving this player. I mean, that is just a line of respect that I think you, you have to acknowledge when you're dealing with said general manager, you have to allow that general manager to do what's right 
to tell his player that he's just been traded. So in that case, I've, yeah, I've, I've lost a number of, of breaks over, over the, the, the years. Another one that I always chuckle at is, you know, we all kind of come out with a pack mentality, which tells me we're all, you know, we're all working on the same story, but I'll tweet something. And then literally 30 seconds later, boom, somebody tweets the exact same thing and somebody mm -hmm. else and then somebody else. Right. So automatically, I guess the sense would be, well, was he just waiting for Gregor to report before he reported? Probably not, but he yeah. probably had the same sort of relationship or agreement with the sources that he's working with or she's yeah. working with to not report it. But as soon as it's out, then, you know, you feel obligated to get in the game because, yeah, you haven't, you haven't destroyed the integrity of the agreement here. You can go to your source and say, Hey, I, I, <laughs> I didn't report it. it. It went out. All I did was confirm and then everybody's happy. But look, I'll tell you this. It's not as bad as it used to be. Yeah. I used to joke that it takes me 11 months to repair the damage that is done the month leading up to the trade deadline, because we have no appreciation for what time of the day it is, um, whether or not players have been told any of that stuff. We just were, it's like pack mentality. Get on this guy. I heard this. So you do a lot of, I'm sorry, I, you know, I'll leave you alone, <laughs> all of that kind of stuff, months leading up to the deadline. Are the Winnipeg Jets one of the tougher teams to get information out of? Yes. Um, yes, they are. And I'm trying to think of a comparison. Um, one would probably be because everybody wants to link me and my history to the Winnipeg Jets, right? Yeah. And I, and yes, I, of course. I understand that. I get it. Um, but you could say the same thing about Dave Nonis, who who's now – you know, in the management group with the Calgary Flames. Dave and I are related. We didn't know we were related until well into our careers. It's a it's a bizarre story. But yeah, we're we're distant cousins. Um, did that help me? Has that helped me at any point? No, it does mm -hmm. best not. Maybe it's helped in the sense that all right, the news gets out. Can you help me? I can't get a hold of all right, let's use the current general manager, Craig Conroy. Dave, yep. can you help me understand why you made this trade? Were there other teams that express interest? What sort of package did it look like before you decided that Vancouver had, had the, the best collection of, of assets for Elias Lindholm? That sort of thing. Uh, so in answer to your question, yeah, Winnipeg is, is difficult because – Chevy has been in that chair a long, long time. And it, you know, most general managers who have been there and done that, um, it drives them crazy when stuff leaks out or bad information gets out, right? Mm -hmm. So the easiest thing to try and manage that is basically to try and, and shut it down or shut it out. So there are times where Winnipeg can be challenging, but they're all good people and they do it with, you know, the best intentions and that's to protect, you know, the people who are involved in the process. When did Chevy trust you enough to tell you more than just what he had for breakfast? Hmm. <laughs> wow. Well, you got to keep in mind, he was the captain of the Brandon Wheat Kings when I was yeah. there. Yeah. So I've known him a long, long time. Um, and given the fact that I rode on these buses with Doug Sauter, the legendary head coach, not just of the Brandon Weed Kings, just historically a legendary Legend. old Legend. school beauty. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> there was stuff that happened when on that bus. Um, <laughs> and I wasn't the only media member that rode the bus uh, back in that day. Um, but I mean, some of the conversations and stuff that was thrown out there, if, if the players on that bus, the coaches on that bus, the managers on that bus, the bus driver didn't trust me at that point for not saying anything. <laughs> so of course I'm, I, I'm, I'm saying all that in jest, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I look, I mean, Chevy and I have an excellent relationship. I'm not going to hide that fact. That's, that's pretty obvious, but does he trust me? as a media person mm -hmm. probably not okay. um i think he probably appreciates my approach just given uh the years of relationship building but i could probably put 10 50 and other general managers in that category of of trust doesn't always serve me well jamie sometimes yeah. again to 
to to go back to what you asked earlier. Uh, but that's fine. You know, I'm, as I am repeating myself, saying it's about the long game. I'd rather be able to to look Kevin Chevelday off in the eye uh, at the upcoming general managers meetings in March in Florida and know that uh, I didn't burn him for the sake of you know reporting on this or that. Um, one of your former teammates, Sarah Lesky, of course, joined us here with the Winnipeg Jets. She, of course, shared a photo with me of one of your guys' traveling excursions. You know where this is going of a pirate shirt. So please, we're, we'll show the photo later when we when we put this up on social media. But uh, tell us if it's the story of the pirate shirt and how it came to be. Well, it was the Winnipeg Jets and uh, the Minnesota Wild, right, in the yeah. playoffs. And um, shockingly, there was a wicked snowstorm that forced us into Chicago to, to try and get there. Uh, and it was borderline planes, trains, and automobiles. And I remember, like, coming down and looking at the sea of luggage and going, I think we're in Chicago at the time and going, Oh boy, we've got a problem here. So there was a luggage mishap. So now we're like, all right, well, what are we going to do? So we get to the hotel in, in Chicago and weirdly enough, because yes, I understand you can go to especially airport hotels and buy t-shirts and all of that, but they literally had, Let's call them dress shirts. And, and, and that's what the, I, I think it was a men's white, just plain dress shirt, but it may have had like kind of puffy sleeves. The sleeves are way, way too long. And Sarah couldn't contain herself as I'm wearing these things and I'm pulling like the billows of the sleeves outside of my suit jacket. Now, what she hasn't acknowledged, I think we've kind of teased each other about it on social media over the years. There was like a tiger or a leopard print blouse. No. That Sarah says, what do you think of this? I'm like, <laughs> oh, you've got to buy that. No, she didn't. I don't think she, I don't uh, remember that. She, she certainly didn't wear it. So yeah, it was, I you know, I'll never forget. Uh, like, yeah, we literally went from the, the gift shop, you know, checked into our individual rooms. And I said, uh, a glass of wine in the lobby in like 20 minutes she goes yep like it was <laughs> it was just utter nonsense but we made the best of a sketchy situation because of what you do and the time that's coming up is of course trade deadlines coming up how many phones do you actually have and when you're and, and when you're at home does the missus or the kids ever say dad you can't answer that no never yeah. Um, and that just comes from going on uh, 33 years of marriage with my wife, Holly, mm. and, yeah. and a number of years here at network television where, you know, I, I, I don't even joke about it anymore. And I don't wear it as, 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 you know, again, a badge of honor or pride. Mm -hmm. Um, the only time I shut my phone off is on an airplane and that's just, it's not even off. It's on airplane mode. Right. Um, and I'm not proud to say this. It's absurd. What I'm about to say is I've actually left my phone on silent, but at funerals, you know, just oh, because yeah. you're yeah. sitting there waiting and you know, something is coming. And of course, I'm not going to be rude enough to type something yeah. out, but yeah. maybe in a split second, you could forward it to a fellow insider like Bob or Pierre or CJ, yeah. that sort of yeah. thing. Right. Uh, so no, Holly has gotten used to it over the years. I, it's been you know, bedside table for as long as I can remember, for as long as I can remember. And I've had lots of crazy phone mishaps, including one last week, which, by the way, I I should knock on wood here. I accidentally dropped my phone in the sink. Now, the sink wasn't yet full of water, yeah. Um, but it definitely got doused with water. And I guess they make them a lot more water friendly than they used to because uh, it's still working. Um, did you last as long as Gene Principe did with the transfer from the BlackBerry over to the next generation of phones? No, uh, I'm, I'm not tech savvy, but again, working with Kiprios back in the early days, I mean, he had yeah. every gadget known to man, like, uh, like the latest in, they weren't wireless back then, but any yeah. sort of noise canceling, whatever, he had that and he had the newest phone and the newest iPad and you name it, the newest, the newest, the newest. So I didn't get on that bandwagon very early. Um, I mean, I'm assuming Gene has upgraded his phone. He, I think he has considerably. Now. Yeah. Uh, now there's so. a bit of a Gene story there. I don't know if you Please. remember this. Yeah. Nope. 
So number one, um, Gene actually replaced me at A Channel in Edmonton. I left A Channel Edmonton to come to TSN or to uh, CTV Sportsnet, right? Back in 98, I guess it was, the summer of 1998. And I remember calling him as I was wrapping up my time there and he was in Toronto. I said, Gino, uh, because I knew he wanted to get back West. And I said, Here's this is a pretty good gig if you're interested. The money is terrible. Let's just be honest and upfront. Na- naturally. Yeah, they they'd have some interest in you. I know they would if you've got some interest there. And then he quickly jumped on it and he's been in Edmonton uh ever since, primarily for family reasons because Gene yeah. is a talented dude, but Gene and I also crossed paths back in the day. Do you know he was a player agent? Gene principally was an NHL what? player agent. When did, he's never told this. What where what happened? I want to say, well, it was he was working at Global Winnipeg. Yeah. And I think it was a side hustle. And I want to say, like somebody like Bryce Salvador, somebody like that. Yeah. Okay. Like, I mean, he maybe had two clients, maybe even one, but mm-hmm. he was dabbling. So the next time you have a conversation with Gene, you gotta. He, oh, he wasn't, for- yeah, he, he, he wasn't committed to it. Obviously he made the wise <laughs> choice and stayed in television, but yeah, for a stretch there, he was on to bigger and better things. Okay. A couple of trade center questions for you before I let you go. Um, the players are oh, sorry. Do you get the sense there are going to be a lot of deals done before trade center? Yeah, because there always is. And, yeah, um, no different this year, right? No, I don't think so. And, you know, I guess maybe I should caution or, or qualify a little bit there because with all due respect to the players who are in play, and there are some decent names, um, you know, the bigger names have already gone, right? With Lindholm going and uh, and Bonahan, of course, going to Winnipeg. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I still think Chris Tanoff is, is going to get traded. But Calgary's playing maybe their best hockey right now. Right. So I wonder if that complicates things a little bit for management there. Uh, you know, I was told by a source close to Noah Hannafin that even though you'd expect that his decision as to whether or not he's going to seriously, you know, consider contemplate his contract extension or dive into the trade market has gotten easier. I mean, we're only days outside of March 8th and a source close to him told me on the weekend that no, it, it, it gets harder every game that he plays because the team is playing great. He arguably is playing his best hockey. Um, and then you, you, you kind of look across the league and you see some of the other stories that would encourage trade. You know, Morgan Riley's getting suspended. The Toronto Maple Leafs have been trying to upgrade their defense, you know, from the moment that Brad Trelawney accepted the job of general manager. So, you know, could he be encouraged to act before March 8th? So the potential of trades happening, given what we know now and what we've seen historically before March 8th, yeah, I think there's a good chance of that. Well, we'll leave Calgary out of this. So which Canadian team that could be a seller at the deadline will play the biggest role at the deadline, in your opinion? Mm. at this moment i know this will change it could change in five minutes yeah it, well and i I'm, I'm hesitating because i'm thinking if you have to leave calgary out of it because of yeah. the obvious which is we've established i i think that there's still some work that will get done in montreal right okay. i mean you've got jake allen who's a really good goaltender still given his resume um you know i i think that he'd be a real nice ad for certainly a team a top contending team, a contending team looking for insurance in the goaltending position, but maybe better than insurance. And I mean, at I, I worst, he's a backup goaltender. Uh, you've got other pieces that Kent Hughes is uh, is is willing to consider moving, although I just got a text out of Montreal all saying it's quiet right now. Mm-hmm. So um, we'll, we'll see if that changes. I think it will. But I think what's also going to adjust is, yes, Hughes and company – are still in the market looking for draft picks and prospects. Um, but they they need young players too, right? Because for sure. the appetite for change in Montreal is is now. And the fan base in Montreal doesn't want to be looking at another year of a decent competitive non-playoff team. No, they they're they're gonna start pounding fists on desks saying, okay, we not only do we need to be competitive here to to satisfy the fan base. We're at worst going to have to be nibbling in a playoff spot in the East. So next to Calgary, I'd say Montreal is most likely to be busy. 
My friend, uh, I'm going to say some prayers for you guys at Trade Center. Hopefully something is going to happen of value uh, over the next still 12 hours of the show. But thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you doing this. Well, Jamie, if you see Bob and me and CJ <laughs> and Pierre all sitting here like yes. this with a, in the background yeah. with the cameras, yeah. Yeah. don't feel sorry for us because we're just pretending because there's nothing going on and we don't want the producers coming to us so we have to fill airtime. You pray for James Duthie in that main <laughs> panel. That's who you pray for. <laughs> thanks, my friend. <laughs> Take care, Jamie. Many thanks to uh, Sarah Lesky for pointing out there's a great story about the pirate shirt that Dregs was wearing when oh, they were traveling. Oh, that tweet and, makes me laugh. Yeah, a so lot. I hope you everybody appreciates the story because it's it's like anybody <laughs> that watched Seinfeld knows about the pirate shirt, but that shirt, the fact that he had to roll it up so many times to keep it in, in check. <laughs> We were on the plane. We were on our way to Minnesota. We had to. We were directed for that. Uh, redirected um, for that. For I didn't that travel at that point. That's right. That's right. I was but left you, at home. Yeah, there were people tweeting my, about where the my jets onesie because <laughs> I was just a baby. You're so young. Yes. Where's the time gone? Yeah. Um, yeah. We got redirected on that one. That was before Game Three of that series against the Minnesota Wild. Anyways, many thanks to Darren Dreger for that and Sarah Lesky for breaking oh. that out. I, you had seen that photo a long time ago. But uh, thank you so much for doing this as always. Yeah, it's good to be here. Just happy to call people old. And yeah, other things. So yeah, really just done a bang up job. Today, <laughs> You've done your part. I? You've done your really part. Really just playing the. Do you want to call me old before we go to or no? Next next one. Next one. Yeah, yeah. maybe we both should get haircuts before our next <laughs> before our I next think you're show. In <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of Tyler Esquivel, Darren Dreger, I'm Jamie Thomas. Thanks so much for watching and or listening to Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. We'll see you next week.